Hello everybody, my name's James. And I'm Liam. And together we are the History Boys. Bodies were lining the streets. The stench of death was thick and tangible in the air. Was this the end of the world? Or was this the end of the world that people in 1348 were used to? If the conditions in the city were bad before the plague hit, they were awful after the plague had arrived in Norwich. The problem had become less theological now. It wasn't a worry about a bad death. It was a worry about how to dispose of the bodies, the volume of bodies. It felt as though every other person was dying. And when that happened, people resorted to desperate measures. And that included people throwing their family members from the top windows of their house onto the street. It meant people paying vagrants to dispose of the bodies in a respectable manner. Of course, they often weren't doing that. And importantly, it also led to the creation of mass graves, or plague pits. Big holes in the ground filled with hundreds, sometimes thousands, of bodies. The authorities in Norwich, and cities like Norwich, really have no choice but to resort to plague pits. There were two big problems to contend with. The first was the sheer volume of bodies. The second was the fact that even if less people had been dying, that there simply weren't the clergy numbers to administer the last rites. It came a question of practicality. And we're still seeing remnants of the plague pits today. Behind me, you'll see this lovely line of lavender. That is a tribute to the plague pits that used to sit under the ground where we're stood right now. They used to plant lavender along the sides of the plague pits as a way of masking the smell. And you can imagine the infrastructural implications of having thousands of bodies buried in such close proximity to where people were living. It was a living nightmare. The stench was awful, the water contaminated, and the reminder that death was in the city at last. Understanding the way in which societies were structured in medieval Europe is crucial to grasping the wider impact of the plague. Critical to this is a system that we now commonly refer to as the Free Estates. These were the basic classes of the medieval world. Those who fight constitutes the class of men, and it is almost entirely men, who are responsible for the defence of the interests of the realm, and in theory, everyone else in it. This class included the king at the very top, his dukes, earls and barons, and then the knights and gentlemen below them. Those who pray were responsible for the spiritual health of the realm. This class comprised of the clergy, which ranged from the bishops and abbots, who were effectively nobles in their own right, to the rector or the humble chaplain. Finally, there's those who work, which covers just about everybody else. These are the toiling masses, both free and unfree, upon whose labour the entire edifice of medieval society was built. each group contributed in their own specific way to the flourishing of the whole. It was critical then that no one aspired above their station. As a result, this society was far less socially mobile than not just modern societies, but also those we find in the ancient world. This formed a kind of involuntary social contract, insofar as one existed, in which playing by the rules was an eligibility requirement for the greatest prize of all, entry into the kingdom of God. To offend or subvert this system, then, could be viewed as an insult to God's will. But what happens when those pillars begin to fall apart, seemingly out of nowhere? This is what happened when the plague hit and the crisis deepened. The stability of the old order began to erode. It would have caused a reckoning, not just for the medieval spirit, but for the ideological foundations upon which this society was built. I'm stood here in a medieval undercroft. Now, an undercroft is effectively a medieval basement. Big stone vaults built by the rich used to fireproof their most valuable possessions. The reason I'm stood here is because a matter of feet away from me, through these big stone walls, would have been piles and piles of bodies. In fact, an Italian chronicler described it 
as like the stacking of a lasagna. Amidst all of the destruction in cities like Norwich, it was a desperate clutching of straws. A wild search for an explanation. Why had the people of England and Europe been punished by the plague? And these explanations vary from the scientific to the deeply religious. On a scientific half, you have people referring to the works of Galen and his four humours theory, which of course we know now was futile. You have people referring to the concept of miasma, the idea that the smell of the plague might be spreading it. On the religious side, you have a far more interesting set of theories. Scapegoats in Europe, the idea that maybe the Jewish population were responsible for the spread of the plague, that they were polluting the waters. Now in England, shamelessly, we had already expelled the Jews in the 1290s. So the English people reacted to the idea of the plague very differently. There were no scapegoats in England, and that led to a more introspective look at what might have caused the plague, and people turned to themselves. If this is God's punishment, what have we done to deserve this punishment? That led to phenomenons, cults, surrounding the idea of death. You had people flagellating themselves in the streets. You had extreme demonstrations of piousness, all in an attempt to absolve themselves of the perceived sin that they must have committed in order to be dealt with such a harsh blow from God. Whilst there are many important distinctions within the contemporary plague accounts, there is also an important point of convergence the belief that the plague is occurring very much on God's watch. Some responded to this somewhat fatalistically, such as the Bishop of Worcester, when he proclaimed that, it is not within the power of man to understand the divine plan. There are even those who seem to have stepped into acceptance of the plague and its mission, such as the chronicler Henry Knighton, who bemoaned the ungodly transformations of the century, such as women attending the jousting, as likely provocations to God's holy and not unwelcome wrath. However, for the vast majority, those whose voices are not often recorded by history, we might want to presume that the most likely reaction would have been one of desperation or just utter helplessness. As a number of clergy dwindled and the nobles simply abandoned their estates and ran away, it's easy to see how a natural crisis became a social crisis. The socio-economic impacts of the plague were hard to ignore. When you have such a deluge of people dying, it suddenly increases the value of the people that were still left alive. And the peasants were very aware of this fact. It caused huge problems for the nobility at the time because land workers were simply walking off their plots. They realised that suddenly, because of the plague, they were a lot more valuable than they were prior to 1348. And the implications would eventually lead to a peasant's revolt. In fact, the impact was so great that it compelled Edward III to introduce legislation in the summer of 1349 that actually forced peasants to work the land that they had been assigned for a reasonable wage, one that didn't exceed wages of the past six years. Of course, this was only a temporary measure. The implications of the plague had already been felt amongst the lowest classes, and soon this would lead to a seismic revolt. As the plague finally ran its course, England could begin to recover. Although there was some initial hesitancy, lords eventually returned to their estates with the expectation that crops would be sown, harvests would be reaped. In short, life as usual would resume. This is reflected in the striking speed with which rulers attempted to restore some semblance of stability. Against all expectations, in most parishes, the majority of vacant land holdings were filled in a matter of weeks, even if it did mean an unprecedented number of daughters becoming tenants for the very first time. However, even expediency could not arrest the profound social and economic forces that had been unleashed by the plague's devastation. The wheels were already in motion. Perhaps anticipating the upheaval which was yet to come, the King and his councillors issued the Ordinance of Labourers in June 1349, an act which sought to reassert the old conditions prior to the plague. 
This, expectedly, was met with stern resistance from a newly empowered toiling class that during the plague, despite all of the destruction, had enjoyed unprecedented freedoms of labour and mobility. These were powers that they were loath to relinquish. Even amongst the landowning classes, there is a reluctance to fully enforce the old laws. That's because the plague had had a massive impact on the medieval economy. A reduced population meant a diminished labour pool, which meant that workers could demand a much higher price for their labour. It's this pressure, coupled with a growing disillusion in the old order, which no longer looks so divine, that set the scene for a new conflict that would redefine the relationship between lord and peasant forever. The time between the plague first arriving on English shores and it dying down in the winter of 1349 was a mere 500 days, but the effects would be felt long after that fact. Indeed, in 1381 we had the Peasants' Revolt, the first real event to occur as a direct result of the impact of the plague. But the plague didn't disappear from England after 1349. Unfortunately for the citizens of medieval England, it continued to rear its head in peaks and troughs that would last until 1666. Even after 1666, which is given as the official ending of the plague as far as England was concerned, the implications would be felt for years to come. Indeed, today, there are still thousands of people each year who are affected by the plague. So what can we learn about the Great Plague of 1348 and 1349? Well, it's fair to say that the people living at the time might have envisaged an apocalyptic situation, the end of the world as they knew it. And they were absolutely right, but perhaps unintentionally correct. Because the world didn't end, the world changed seismically. And this was due to two key factors. Firstly, a huge undermining of the church, and secondly, an undermining of a feudal system that kept the toiling classes chained to their land for generations. All of that changed after the plague. Suddenly, the toiling classes realised in themselves a new found agency. And whilst they didn't know it at the time, the impact of the plague completely and irreversibly changed the world. I hope you've enjoyed the finale of our third ever trilogy on the history of the Black Death. If you liked it, please give us a like, leave a comment with some feedback and share with your friends. We have lots of historical goodness planned for the year ahead, so if you've liked what you've seen, please make sure to subscribe.